Mr. Perrin and Mr. Trail. The novel by Hugh Walpole, adapted for radio by Val Gilgood, with Marius Goring, Hugh Burden, Jeremy Clyde, Joan Matheson, and Sandra Clark. The story of Mr. Perrin and Mr. Trail is set in the West Country at the turn of the century. Mr. Perrin was 45, with pale, watery eyes and eyebrows of the same sandy colour as his moustache. He had been a master at Moffat's for over 20 years. He was a little bent as he walked, his hands folded behind his back, trailing a rough, ugly walking stick along the ground. Ah, yes. Barker Manor, French, Doggett, and Rogers. Back from the holidays. Good. Yes, it shall be all right this time. I played golf well during the holidays. The men at the club are not quite such idiots as they usually are. Uh, Perrin, giving us one of your lectures as usual? I might. If you'd only listen patiently for a change. Ah, what shall it be? Public school morality? What a mother can do for her boy? <laughs> when do you go back? Tomorrow, worse luck. No, you'll survive, I expect. I hope so. I have a new man to break in. Poor devil. I expect he'll follow my suggestions. At any rate, he can't be worse than young Searle, the fellow I had to cope with last term. He was unspeakable. From the ridiculous to the sublime. Of course, this term it'll be all right. Miss Dessart. Isabel Dessart. Bless her. Now for my dear fellow sufferers. Mm -hmm. Ah, here we are again. Well, glad to see you, Perry. Good holidays. You are not. Dear me, no cake? Oh, oh I say I'm... So sorry, I'm afraid I took the last one, Perrin. Ring the bell. Oh. Uh, the tea hasn't improved. That's certain. Cold and leathery. I say, Perrin, have you made out your bath lists and then there are locker names? Uh, Dormer, please. My tea first. All right, but it's getting on for four. There might be seen dimly in the passage outside the common room a misty cloud of white-eaten collars and round white faces. Perrin walked slowly to the door. So, here we all are again. How pleasant. How very pleasant. All of us eager to come back, of course. Mm -hmm. Yes. You know you oughtn't to come now. It's only two minutes past four. I'll take our names in another five minutes. Haven't you eyes, Sexton? Don't you know that ten minutes past four is ten minutes past four and not four o'clock? Yes, sir. Sir, Please, you sir. said we... Yes, had the young man there. The door opened again, and someone came in. Trail, the new master. The first impression of him standing in the doorway was of someone young and eager to make friends. Brown Norfolk jacket, grey flannel trousers, light brown hair parted in the middle and brushed back. He looked beyond everything else clean. His socks were bright purple. Meet Mr. Perrin, Trey. How do you do? He'll tell you all about everything, won't you, Perrin? I'll try my best. I must say, as far as order goes, I've never found any trouble. Oh. I've always managed them all right. You'll find them a trifle rested the first few days, seeing what you're made of. Just dropping them, good and hard. That'll do the trick. Excuse me, sir. You told me to bring the new boys, sir. Pippi Minor is crying in Matron's room. Then you can cut along, Sexton. Yes, sir. Now, you boys, pocket money. It would be safer for you to hand it over to me. Then you shall have it when you want it. Well, Brackets, I can see two half crowns. Is that all you have? Yes, sir. I don't like to see you so fond of money, Brackets. I doubt if you'll see these two half crowns again. No, sir. Caught friend Brackets on the hip that time, I fancy. Ah, uh, you take the big room with me, Trail. Very well. I'll give you paper and blotting paper.
Shrale had learned during his three years at Cambridge that above all things one must not worry. He had found that two thirds in his history tripos and a blue for rugby football were easily obtained. He found that the second of these things led to a popularity, inviting a pleasant indifference to thought and discussion, and he was extremely happy. He might well have secured something better than a post at Muppets, but he had left it lazily until the last and been forced to accept what he could get. In a term or two, he hoped to return to Clifton, which meant that his stay at Muffet's was in the nature of an interlude. It is indeed one of the most curious aspects of the whole affair that he remained for so long blind to all that was going on. He was of a surprising simplicity. As to people, there was a week in town every now and then. There was his mother, a widow, and he was her only son, whom he entirely worshipped. There was no one whom he really disliked. And there were one or two girls, not very seriously, in the background. He writes of Muffet's. You never saw anything so hideous. The red brick all looks so fresh. The stone corridors all smell so new. The iron and brass of the place is all so strong and regular. It's like the labs at Cambridge on an extensive scale. You'd think they were inventing gases or something, not teaching boys the way they should go. It's the fresh lobster colour of it that I can't stand. He had, during that first week, too much to do to get any very concrete idea of the staff. On the first morning, there was a master's meeting, and he could see them all sitting heavily and despondently in conclave. The Reverend Moy Thompson, the headmaster, a venerable-looking clergyman with a long, grizzled beard and bony fingers, sat at the end of the table, as though longing for an excuse to fly into a temper. For the others, Trail only noticed Perrin, Clinton and Dormer, apart from a stout man with a heavy moustache, an agitated little Frenchman, and a thin, bony little man with a wiry moustache and cynical speech that seemed to goad Moy Thompson to fury. It appeared that the stout man with the moustache was called Comba. He had once been a famous football player. The little Frenchman, Monsieur Ponce, spent his time hating England and preparing to leave it, an escape that he never achieved. The little man, Bertrand by name, seemed to trail the most interesting of the company. Caustic in manner, he was feared by the whole staff. White, the nervous man, never opened his mouth. Everyone during this first week was pleasant and agreeable. The ladies of the establishment came to Trail's notice more slowly, but Mrs. Comba appeared on the scene quite clearly. I don't know how it happened. It was all so jolly and noisy in the early days when I was only the daughter of a country clergyman, youngest of six sisters. And Freddy was so young, so handsome. But somehow, from the moment of my marriage, I found nothing to hold on to at all. I determined to make second best do and only gradually accepted acquiescence in something that bore no resemblance to the glorious radiance I'd anticipated. It says everything for Mrs. Comber's pluck and determined stupidity that she lived now, after 15 years of married life, still on the threshold of expectation. She extended her attempts at romance to wider fields. As far as Freddy, her husband, was concerned, she was always hoping that it would change. But her three boys, fat, stolid and stupid, cared nothing for her at all. They were unpleasant boys. But against all this rejection and muddled confusion, there was Isabel Desart. Dearest Isabel, you can't know what you've come to mean to me. Oh, that's nonsense. The way you keep coming down here and staying for so long when you could be having a glorious time with your friends in London. Muffet's is so dull, and all the people here. Isabel managed somehow to fit in. With rather short brown hair curling about her head, straight eyes, firm mouth and vigorous, unerring movements, to most people she was like a delightful boy, healthy, direct and uncompromising. You see, dear, I know you, your tenderness, your understanding, and the boys love and trust you. Oh, I manage things for them sometimes. Mm, of course, I don't hit it off with Mrs. Moy Thompson and those four lady matrons. Mrs. Moy Thompson... 
has been crushed for ages by that grim, bony old husband of hers. She lets him bully her to his heart's content. When Mrs. Comber asked Vincent Perrin to her dinner party, he was delighted, although he assumed indifference. This was at the end of the first week of term, and he had not yet spoken to Isabel Dessart. He had merely bowed to her across the grass and gone indoors to teach the lower third algebra with a beating heart. He did not realise that Mrs. Comber was giving a dinner for trail. I don't like the woman. All the same, I think she must have noticed my, uh, my attachment and wants to help me along. After all, 45, no sort of age, and those things I wear at night to hold my moustache straight seem to be doing the trick. Yes, Mother, you're perfectly right. There is someone. Oh. And I believe she cares for me. When I'm ready to ask her, I'm pretty sure she'll say yes. Of course, I shall have to find a new house, and there'll be a nice sunny room for you, old lady. But uh, suppose I don't like her. I'm sure you will. Oh, you can't be sure about these things, Vincent. You see, I always think of you as a thin, serious little boy in knickerbockers. You might at least forget the knickerbockers. Oh, but you look sweet in them. Uh, and this term is going to be all right. Now, Mother, I must be off. So, give me a kiss. Of course. Thank you. By the way, the girl's name is Dessart. Isabel Dessart. Mm, it's pretty. Not as pretty as she is, Mother. Giving a dinner party was no light thing for Mrs. Comber. There was, in the first place, ways and means. She was forced to drive her frail cockle shell between the scylla of increased bills and the charybdis of not being smart enough. Were things not right? No mushroom savouries, no meringues. The party had better not be given at all. On the other hand, there was the end of the month coming up. Nothing in hand. And Freddy scowling to such an extent that to speak to him was out of the question. Every party was an attempt to win Freddy back to her. And then the people to ask. Vincent Perrin. I don't like him, but I ought to. Uh, uh, the Dormers. It's time they were asked. And the elder Miss Madder. Perhaps she won't talk too much, nor really spitefully. If only we didn't have to play bridge afterwards. I'm so bad at cards, so I'm bound to lose. I always do. And I need every penny for the boys' clothes. Mrs. Comber said nothing to Isabel about young Trail. She didn't even think she had as yet noticed him. Neither of them said a word about Mr. Perrin. They were all waiting for Freddie Comber. <laughs> Poor Freddy is always late, Mr. Trail. They work him so hard, you know. I know, Mrs. Comber. Um, I, I hope you like meringues, Mr. Trail. Everyone here seems to, with, with jam in them. Uh, the, the other night, I had such a good hand in hearts, but we had such bad luck, and I ought to have played my king when I did... <laughs> I, I, I'm always telling Freddy to go and dress earlier, but he stays working. Well, Mr. Perrin, I hardly seem to have had a sight of you since term began. You, you know Miss Desart, of course. Not so well as I should like to. She always looks a picture. That dress, very simply cut, but just right with that golden girdle round her waist. Capital taste, I think. It seemed Mr. Perrin and the moment must be recorded as the first instant of his dislike, that Trail was absurdly overdressed, with hair so brushed and parted that you would almost see your face in it. His coat fitted amazingly, and there was a wonderful white waistcoat with pearl buttons and a splendid even line of white cuff below the sleeve. Perrin dragged out his own cuffs, saw there was a frayed piece that had escaped his scissors, and pushed them back again. So they went into dinner, and Trail took Isabel in, and that was the first time she had consciously recognised him. But she liked his voice. And how do you like being a schoolmaster, Mr. Trail? Oh, I love it. Oh, then I shall leave you to your illusions. The boys like you. Well, they told you? Oh, one soon knows. They are cruelly frank. 
ready. I think Mr. Dormer wants to talk to you. Isn't it about time we had some fish? It won't be a minute now, I'm sure. A mighty long minute. And the timetable of Moyt Thompson's is perfectly absurd. It only means that Bertrand has one solid hour less than the rest of us. Tell me, Mr. Perrin. Well, obviously, like Mr. Trail, you love it here at Moffitt's, or, or you wouldn't have stayed here so long. But how do you see your future? It's hard to say, Miss Desert. I fancy I'm able enough. It only needs something to force me out of the rut. There's not much a man can't do if he really tries. If... Uh... Yes, if? Well, marriage, for instance, can be a great help to a man. One never knows. This claret of Freddy Combers is really horrible. Personally, I hope there'll be several extra halves this term. Oh, so do I, Mrs. Dormer. You know, they always used to give the boys a half for every new baby born in the establishment. You and I have done our duty nobly in that direction, haven't we? I prefer not to talk about such things, Mrs. Comber. Uh, I hope the football will be good this season, Mr. Comber. Should be. Couldn't be worse than last. There was still, of course, bridge. Mrs. Comber was playing with Dormer against her husband and Miss Manor. Mr. Perrin was playing with Mrs. Dormer against Isabel de Sart and young Trail at another table. So Perrin was forced to gaze over a small intervening space at Trail's immaculate clothes for the rest of the evening. They were acutely conscious of each other. Well, Mr. Perrin, if you'd only managed to follow one of my leads, we could have done a lot better than that. I'm sorry, Mrs. Dormer. After all, I was at Cambridge for three years, and I've taught algebra and Euclid here at Moffat for three days every week. So I ought to know something about a simple game like bridge. Uh, you to play, I think, Mrs. Comber. Oh, of course. I, I, I'm so sorry. It's my lead. Uh, I beg your pardon, but what a trumps. I'm afraid I must be going. Oh? oh. Uh, yes, I know we ought to have won, Mrs. Dormer. I can't think what went wrong. Considering the way my wife's been playing, Perrin... I think it's just as well to stop. Oh, well, good night, Mrs. Dormer. I'm oh, well. so glad you enjoyed it. Yes. We meet tomorrow, of course, though I can't think why the men aren't going to play golf. I, I fancy we'll be having a storm soon. Probably because of the football tomorrow afternoon. Oh, Mr. Zart, I'd be delighted to see you home. Oh, thank you. Uh, good night, Mrs. Comber. Oh, good, uh, thank good you so night, much. I love the evening. Uh, good night, Comber. Good, good night, night, Mrs. Comber. Good, good, night, Mrs. Comber. Good, night, Comber. good night, Mr. Perrin. Good night, Miss Desert. And Mr. Perrin was left alone on the step. Isabel's head, as she and Trail walked down the gravel path, was full of her hostess. Poor Mrs. Comber. Oh, I'm afraid I hate Mrs. Dormer. Isn't that a little extreme? Perhaps. It's true for all that. Oh, it must be that storm coming up. It was rather depressing tonight's function, wasn't it? Just a little. I'm glad you like it here at Moffitt's. Oh, but you don't want to stay here all your life, do you? Oh, just a term or two. And then I hope to go back to my old school, Clifton. You see, Mr. Trailer... It really isn't a very good place to be in, this. Why not? Oh, it's hard to explain without maligning people and, and making things out worse than they really are. It would, I suppose, be awful if one had to stay here forever, like Perrin and Dormer and the others. Oh, but next year, I hope, will see me somewhere better. Well, mind you, stick to that, Mr. Trail. I have a horrible sort of feeling that all of them meant to go away very soon. And here they still are, soured and disappointed. It doesn't bear thinking of. So long as one has ambition, and I have. Oh, then mind you hang on to it. Good night, Mr. Trail. Good night. Perrin's bedroom was next to Trail's. Opposite their doors was a bathroom containing two baths. In this bathroom, Trail always arrived some two minutes after Perrin. The latter always filled both baths, one with hot water, one with cold, and stood moodily, his naked body gaunt and bony in the grey light, watching them while they filled. I say, Perrin, why not have hot and cold in the same bath? Really, Trail, it isn't, I should have thought, quite your place to make that sort of remark. The incident at the morning paper was equally trivial. Dormer always breakfasted in his own house, which left three of them. 
they clubbed together and had three newspapers, the Daily Mirror, the Daily Mail, and the local affair. So obviously the person who came in last was left with the local paper. As I have to take prep in the upper school, I expect trail that the Mirror should be left for me. Do you, Perrin? I don't see why. We all pay the same subscription for papers, and Clinton always takes the Daily Mail. Which leaves me with the Western Morning News. It's not good enough. I don't see why you should adopt that attitude, Perrin. And I don't see, Trail, why you always want to talk over breakfast. It's not civilised. At the end of the first month, Trail did not see these things as in any way ominous. He never analysed things. He took them as they came and used them. Then Birkeland, whose aggressive personality and caustic humour had attracted him, asked Trail to come and see him and talked in the most amazing way. Sorry about all the mess, Trail. <laughs> Nothing to worry about. I've been wanting to ask you some questions for quite a time. You... you like Muffets? Immensely. Why? Oh, why not? It gives me what I want. And plenty of exercise, healthy hours, oh, and I like teaching. How long do you mean to stay here? Oh, a year, I suppose. And then I want to go to Clifton. You better not tell the head that. How do you like the other men? I think they're very good fellows. Dormer's splendid. Right. And Perrin? He's all right. He seems to get annoyed rather easily. Well, well, once or twice, frankly, he has irritated me a good deal. Well, everyone's wanted to cut Perrin's throat sometime or other. So you like it? Of course. Don't you? Better not ask me that, young man, if you want an encouraging answer. I'm going to speak the truth to you this evening for the good and safety of your soul. And I haven't cared about the good and safety of anyone's soul for... Well, I should be afraid to say how long. However, I care enough to speak to you. And the one thing I have to say is... Get out. Get away. Fly for your life. If you don't, you will die very soon. In a year, perhaps. We're all dead here, and we died a great many years ago. Well, isn't that rather exaggerated? I'm not very observant. I'm not at all clever. I'm... Have you ever looked round the common room and seen what kind of men we all are? Men who are underpaid, with no prospects, herded together, wanting, perhaps, towards the end of term, to cut each other's throats. Do you suppose that is good for the boys they teach? It's a different thing with the bigger places. There's more room. But here... My God. Get out of it, Trail, you fool. You talk about quitting in a year's time. Do you suppose that I meant to stay here forever when I came? You think another term will be better. Or you try for something, fail and get discouraged. And then suddenly, you're too old. Too old in your thirties and liable to be turned out at a week's notice if the head doesn't like you. Oh, surely. Turned out with nothing to go to. And the head knows that you're afraid of him and plays games with you. <laughs> you think you'll escape, but already the place has its fingers about you. By the end of term, you'll be a different man. You'll be allowed no friends. Only enemies. You think the rest of us like you? Well, I don't think they actually... For the dis moment, perhaps. Already you say you dislike Perrin. You must not be friends with the head, because then we shall think you are spying on us. You must not be friends with us, because then the head will hate you, because he will think that you are conspiring against him. You must not be friends with the boys, because then we shall all hate you, and they will despise you. You will be quite alone. Oh, come now, Bertrand. Draw it mild. You think you're going to teach with freshness and interest. You're full of eager plans and new ideas. Every plan, every idea will be immediately killed. You must not have them. They're no good for examinations. You're just trying to prove you're superior. No, but really, I... You have got to hear me out, Trail. It all goes deeper. It is self-murder. You are going to kill, you have got to kill, every fine thought, every hope that you possess. You'll be laughed at for your ambition and your hopes. 
You will not even be allowed any fine vices. You must never go anywhere because you may be neglecting your work. Well, here we are, 15 men all hating each other, loathing everything the other man does, the way he eats, moves, the way he teaches. We sleep next door to each other, we eat together, we meet all day until late at night hating each other. Well, it's only for a few weeks, and there are the holidays after all. I tell you that if term lasted another week or two, murder would be committed. The holidays come. You go out into the world and find you're different from all other men. And I know that you're different. You are patronizing, narrow, egoistic. You see others shunning you and back here you come again. If you marry, see what comes of it. Look at Mrs. Dormer, Mrs. Comber, Mrs. Moy Thompson. Look at their husbands. <laughs> so much for marriage. No money, no prospects. Perhaps at the end, starvation. And gradually there creeps over you a dreadful inertia. You do not think. Oh, yes, but you I do don't not think care. You... you are a ghost. Only... Towards the end of term, when examinations come, there creeps about the place a new devil. Our hatred of each other begins to be active. We're all tired, horribly tired. And be careful then what you do and what you say. Mind if I fill my pipe? Go ahead. Thanks. My word, you've drawn a horrible picture of things. It's hysteria. Oh, of course, you don't see it my way. Why should you? But it's true for all that. I'm resigned now. Besides, it's the beginning of a new term. Just now, I'm inclined to think it isn't true myself. But just wait and see. Watch White after he's had an interview with the head. See Perrin and Gomber and study Mrs. Gomber. You won't listen to me. Why should you? But in ten years' time, maybe... You'll remember what I've been saying. It was all rot, wasn't it? What was all rot? Hmm? About the place. This place. All rot. Of course. Forget it. I'll do my best. I'm sure you will. Oh, good afternoon, Mr. Trail. Good afternoon, Mr. Zart. I didn't see you for a moment. <laughs> Don't you think one of us ought to talk? It's so wonderfully quiet here that it's almost frightening. We're both so very young. Uh, yes, but why not? Well, for the things we shall have to do. You for the boys and I for my poor Mrs. Comba. I had thought when I first saw you that you were going to be old enough. Now I don't think you are. Oh, I know that I can't. It isn't for anything you can't do. It's that you don't see it. Oh, you're too much in the middle. I, I suppose it's only outsiders, like me, who can really understand. But I get so depressed sometimes with it all that I think I'll leave it, go back to London, and never see Moffats again. Oh, I don't seem to be any use at all. And somehow it all seems worse in the autumn. Oh, poor Mr. Trail. I always happen to be gloomy when we meet. And I'm not really gloomy at all. But what is this all about? Uh, please, don't go to London. I hope you won't think of it. Why? Do you like my being here? Like is hardly the word I would choose. Well, that's one on my side at any rate. Oh, I have to go in here. <laughs> Tea, you understand. <laughs> you don't in the least know what I mean, but you'll be a help. I shall look across chapel in the evening and... And know that I have a friend. Sometimes I think things can't be true. The things that go on here. I'm so sorry for, for all of them. But I don't want to have to be sorry for you as well. Please. It was dark. And the long hill that stretched above Isabel was black and ominous. The lights of Moffat showed to the right at the top and the darker shape of its buildings cut the lighter grey of the sky. Good evening, Miss oh, Dessart. Oh, good evening, Mr. Perrin. Oh, I'm sorry. You startled me. It's so dark. 
How is Mr. Trail getting on in the lower school? I, I hope you all like him. Well, the boys seem to have taken to him. But then, of course, his football is a quick road to their favour. Trail? Young, of course. Young, and one can only learn by experience. He is perhaps just a little inclined to be cocksure. A fault in the young, of course. Oh, I found him very modest and pleasant. Of course, I haven't seen very much of him, but what I have seen, I've liked. In the light of the lamps at the corner of the road, Isabel saw Mr. Perrin's face. He looked very white. His eyes were looking into hers and beseeching like a dumb animal's. Miss Desart, I'd, I'd be awfully glad if one day... I... I'd be so flattered if you would come with me for a walk one day. Why, of course, Mr. Perrin. I shall be delighted. Good night, Mr. Perrin. Good night, Mr. Sun. Perrin stood, looking after her. Later, Mr. Perrin, the midday mutton close about his head, surveyed in his dingy sitting room four small boys who gazed at him with staring eyes and jumping throats. I go in the rain and more than needs the rope, the rope, a rope... That, that will do, that... young garden. You had better write out the whole poem 50 times before lock-up. It's obvious that you don't know a word of the noble Robert Browning's The Patriot and that you've made no attempt to learn it. I fear it will devolve upon your lordship, friend garden, to write out the poem no less than 50 times. I grieve, I sympathise, but the law commands. Oh, there's a most ripping match this afternoon, sir. A fool I may be, Garden, but I have observed that there is, as you say, a ripping match. All the same, I fear the poem calls you, friend Garden. Oh, it would be an awful pity, sir, to miss such a decent that day. That will do, Garden. You will get it a hundred times if you're not careful. Silly pompous ass. I must get out into the air. My head's very bad. And I should let my mother know that things with Miss Desart are practically arranged. Thank heaven I managed to keep that puppy trail in his place. I dislike him more and more. Conceited and insufferable idiot. I see you, chaps. Where's Garden? Swatting up something for old Pompous. Bloody firewood. I thought Pompous was rather sweet on Garden. He is, but Garden can't stand him. No wonder, blithering ass with his long words. Little beast, I'll punish them. Perrin saw Comber in the distance, turned to avoid him, and found himself confronting Mrs. Comber and Isabel Desart. We would um, appear to be winning, Mrs. Cumber. That nice Mr. Trail. I do like to see people run like that. Oh, it's half time. Well, that was a splendid run of Mr. Trail's. Oh, didn't you think so, Mr. Perrin? I'm afraid I didn't see. At five o'clock, scowling heavily, Garden presented the poem, neatly written out, 50 times. It was about this time that Archie Trail accepted an invitation to a dance at Sir Henry Trojan's. Only a small dance, and to be over by twelve. It was Clinton's evening on duty, and therefore there was no obvious need to say anything about it. But Trail thought that he would go and get leave from Moy Thompson, and knocked at the latter's door accordingly. He saw that White, the nervous man who took the classical fifth, was standing by Moy Thompson's table. I think I told you, White. I'm sorry to disturb you, Headmaster. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, don't go, Trail. I shall be ready for you in a moment. Did I not tell you, White, that Morris was on no account to have an ex yet? I know, uh, but his father was only to be in London for an hour. He has not seen his son for a year, so I thought that if you knew all the circumstances, you would not object. That does not alter the fact that I had expressed a wish to the contrary. What is your position here, White? Are you or are you not here to consider my wishes? What are you paid to do? Of course, if you're dissatisfied with conditions here, you've only to say so. It should be possible to fill your place. I have no complaint, Headmaster. I'm sorry. You must I... remember your position. I've yet to discover any paid position that enables you to indulge your fancies when and as you please. No doubt you are better informed, White. Uh, just a moment, Trail. 
Moy Thompson was smiling. White's haggard figure looked tortured. It was cruelty, devilish cruelty, for Moy Thompson to smile with them both there in the room. Trail was so angry that on the impulse of the moment he had almost flung in his resignation. Moy Thompson was playing with them as a cat does with a mouse. Trail followed White out of the room. Then in the dark passage he held out his hand and caught White's. White held his for an instant, then slipped away with a startled look. Trail remembered what Birkeland had said. But the dance was most enjoyable. Trail had never enjoyed himself so much before. It was as if he had escaped from imprisonment. When it was all over, he sped back again over the hill towards Moffat's, thinking of Isabel Desart all the way. One o'clock, by Jove. I had no idea it was so late. Damn this front door. It seems to have jammed. It won't look too good if I have to stay out all night. I'll die before I ring. By Jove, I believe I can climb up. There's a handy buttress and an unlatched window. I shall have to jump. Oh. 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 Who's there? What's all that noise? It is his eyes. Trail. I'm still feeling stunned. You? Trail? Yeah, yes, I've been out. I, I fell on the table amongst the plates and things. I, I'm sorry. You I... made a great noise. You woke me up. Oh, I'm, I'm most awfully sorry. You made a great noise. It is one o'clock. You're all the same, Perrin. You needn't talk like Robespierre condemning King Louis to execution. My, my key jammed in the lock. Oh. Oh, I'm, I'm frightfully sorry. I can't help it. You look so funny, Perrin, with your shadow on the wall gigantic head with your hair sticking out all round like spears. Perrin said nothing. Trail followed him slowly down the passage. Suddenly, he was frightened. He didn't know why. Perrin slept badly. Next morning in class, the old hallucination that twenty boys were in reality five hundred crept over him. They sat in a stupid, irritated row at hard wooden desks soiled with ink. The fifth proposition of the first book of Euclid was scarcely calculated to show dull boys at their brightest and best. Perrin found that the form knew nothing about it at all. Now, you there in the back row. Pumpkin Walpole, isn't it? Yes, sir. May I ask why you haven't even tried to do your preparatory work? I'm sorry, sir. No doubt. And unless I'm much mistaken, you're going to be sorrier still. You are not attending, Master Pump at Walpole. You seem to be drawing. Let me see the results. <laughs> Here you are, sir. I can hardly congratulate you. People with tiny legs and noses like pens. Or smudges. <laughs> I'm sorry, sir. Too much sorrow is unbecoming in the young. I'll try another of you. Garden. Garden minimus. You seem to be sulking garden, frowning like that. It's not very pretty. Take the triangle A, B, C. Yes, garden. I grieve to think of the amount of time you must have spent over its preparation. You'll be overdoing it if you go on like this. You really mustn't work so hard. Meanwhile, write it out 30 times and say it to be tonight after tea. Go to your seat. Come. Ah, Perrin. Something I can do for you? It's about Trail, Headmaster. I wanted to talk to you about Trail. How is he doing? Well enough. The boys seem to like him. Do they? Really? I think he indulges them rather. I'm not sure that he sticks to his work as he should. What makes you say that, Perrin? I found him jumping through the lower school dining room window at one o'clock this morning. Did you indeed? Where had he been? I didn't care to ask. 
I didn't care to. I don't think there's anything else we have to discuss, Headmaster. No. I shall talk to Trail, of course. Right. My dear Clinton, Toggart at wing three quarter is perfectly absurd. Obviously, Trail's choice. You must admit, though, Comber, that Trail himself plays a capital game. Maybe, Clinton. The fact remains that his knowledge of the theory of the game is non-existent. Really? Why the devil Trail wants to put Toggart there, I can't imagine. I should get them to stamp and rush about a bit more, Ponce, if I were you. <laughs> it's delightful for me being just under you in my room. So nice to think your boys are really enjoying themselves. I keep them perfectly still all this morning. Still as one mouse, no one stirs. You can hear a pin drop. Then you must have dropped a cartload of them, Ponce. Try and drop less next time. The headmaster wishes to see Mr. Trail at 12. Glad to hear it, I must say. Sit down, Trail. Thank you, Headmaster. I hope this time is convenient for you. Perfectly. Good. I've been meaning to come down and look at your form, but I've had no opportunity. I must try to arrange it. I hope you've had no trouble with discipline. None. The boys are excellent. Mm, that's splendid. I hope you take your work seriously, Mr. Trail. I think I do. That is well. You see, we are a great institution, a very great institution. We owe our traditions a serious attention to detail. To work together as one man for the good of the race, that must be our object. No divisions, all in friendly brotherhood. I hope you agree with me, Mr. Trey. I hope you've not found me wanting, Headmaster. I think I've worked. Worked, yes. What about play? Surely my football is... Football is no more than a detail. But Mr. Perrin informs me that you came in at one o'clock this morning through a window. I confess that surprised me. It is quite true. Ah, I please, went... no more. The facts are sufficient in themselves. Only I think you will agree with me that it should not occur again. Well, as I told Mr. Perrin, we I'm sorry. We shall not refer to it again, but work and play together are impossible. We have long holidays that give us all we need. By the way... Here are the scholarship questions that you've set, geography and history. They're scarcely what we require. Perhaps you would not mind resetting them and bringing them to me tomorrow. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Trail. Over the sea, a tremendous wind was blowing. About Trail, it screamed and tugged at his clothes. The rain lashed his face. He stood facing the sea with his hands clenched. Isabel Dessart, as she came down the road and saw him there, knew in that moment that she loved him, had loved him from the first moment she had seen him. They could not speak to one another. The noise was too great. mist swept about their heads, the spray beat in their faces. For a moment he held her with his face pressed close against hers, and their lips met. At last, still without a word, they moved slowly away along the road. Well, hello, Trail. Come and sit down, won't you? Well, thanks, Perrin. I'd rather stand. Did you by any chance say something to the head about my coming in late last night? My dear Trail, I really don't remember. And after all, is it any business of yours? Only this much. He's been speaking to me about it. He says that you told him. I want to know why. It is my business, as housemaster here, to find out anything that may harm my pupils. I consider your late hours, your... your disregard of your work, prejudicial to the school's progress. Yes. That is my opinion. If you feel that I've been neglecting my duty, I can only say that I'm sorry I don't feel that one night's outing can do much harm. I only mentioned it because I've been feeling these last few weeks that we've not been very good friends. Insofar as I am to blame, I'm genuinely sorry. I'm glad you feel like that, Trail. One must keep discipline, you know. Of course, you're young. When you're older, you'll see that there's something in what I say and schoolmastering takes some learning. But I'm sure I'm glad you feel sorry. All right. A 
keep that advice for others. I don't know that I was so very wrong after all. What business was it of yours to go sneaking to the head like that? Well, there are some things that a gentleman doesn't do. I can forgive something to your age. But this sort of impertinence... I don't think you remember to whom we are speaking. You are only the junior master here. And you must be taught that when those who are wiser than you are choose to give you advice, you should take it gratefully. My God, of all the conceited, insufferable... Get out of my room. All right. When I've told you what I think of you... Get out of my room. And take care you don't come back here again. Trail and Isabel kept their secret to themselves. Their meetings were few and difficult. We're so happy, Archie. We, we really can't quarrel with anyone. Hmm. And Mr. Perrin, oh, poor man. No wonder he's irritable. He's miserably disappointed. And I, I don't think he's well, either. Oh, we can afford to put up with some ill temper from other people just now. Mr. Perrin looks quite dreadfully white and strained. Oh, but we're so happy, and he's so unhappy. It is a little unfair, isn't it? Trail kissed her and went back resolved to be pleasant and agreeable. Perrin had had bad headaches, and his form suffered. On this dark and dreary Monday early rising to the cold, summoning of the bell was anything but pleasant. Trail was in no brighter temper as he hurried down the cold stone passages, pulling on his gown. He heard the rain beating down. Hurriedly selected the first umbrella he saw on the stand and rushed to the upper school. In the junior common room, the rain was driving furiously against the window panes. Trail sat down with an air of relief as Clinton grabbed the Daily Mail and began to chatter. My word, Trail, did you see this? The Quinns fairly wiped the floor with the Scottish on Saturday. Delicious sausages. Have some. Perrin's having breakfast in there, isn't he? He won't want any more. He sometimes does. He's awfully sick if he comes in hungry and doesn't find anything. Perrin's rather amusing when he's sick. By the way, has the head passed those exam questions of yours yet? He has not. No. He's made me do them five times now, and the last time he crossed out a whole lot of questions that he'd suggested himself. Who are you? I said as much, and he called me politely and gently, but firmly, a liar. He's got his knife into me all right, and I've got friend Perrin to thank for it. Yes, Perrin doesn't love you, that's obvious. And young Garden has been helping the feud along. Young Garden? What's he got to do with it? Well, he always was a special pet of Perrin's. Perrin kept him in or something, so now he goes about telling everybody that he's transferred his allegiance to you. That infuriates Perrin. I confess I rather like the boy. You write it out a hundred times, Garden. And you don't go out till you've done it. I don't know what's come over that boy, Garden. Nothing but continuous impertinence. We should go up to the head if he isn't careful. I see that you two are reading the mirror and the mail. Oh, well, there's no point in my saying anything about it. None at all, Perrin. You know, Clinton, a little less appetite on your part in the early morning would improve things for everybody. Don't I smell sausages? Oh, finished, I'm afraid, old man. I can't find my umbrella. Pass them when it's pouring like this. Have you seen my umbrella, Clinton? No. Why should I have seen it? Isn't it in the stand? It is not. I know I had it last night. Clinton, you must have seen it. I tell you, I haven't. My word, isn't it raining? It certainly is. Well, someone must have seen it somewhere. It's absurd. I, I want to go out. Try one of the others. But I must have my umbrella. I have to go to the upper school. Oh, I'm terribly sorry, but I'm afraid I must have taken it by mistake. If I'd thought it was yours, I wouldn't have dreamed... You... Trail? I'm afraid I took the first one I saw this morning. As yours is missing, it must have been yours, but I assure you... You dared to I... take my umbrella without asking me? I never heard of such impertinence. But it's all of a piece, all of a piece. Oh, this is really too absurd. As though a man mightn't take another man's umbrella without all this fuss. It's absurd. Oh, is it? It's like the rest of your behavior here. You come here imagining that everything belongs to you. We've all got to bow down to everything your highness chooses to say. We must give out everything to your highness, you... you insufferable puppy. I'm exceedingly sorry. I took your umbrella. I don't see that that gives you any reason to speak to me like that. Uh, later, if you like, but not here. Of course, to you it's nothing at all. 
If you don't know how to behave, it's time someone taught you. Gentlemen, do not steal other people's things. I didn't steal your infernal umbrella, Perrin. I don't want your beastly things, any of them. Keep them to yourself. I say you two chuck it. Don't make such a row in here. Everyone can hear. Give me my umbrella, do you hear? Give me my umbrella. I tell you, I haven't got your rotten umbrella. I must have left it somewhere, and I'm glad you can go out in the rain and look for it. Look out for the coffee thing! I realise it was just a stupid, rather squalid scene, Archie. All the same, I'm rather scared. You're all at such terribly close quarters. That's true enough. The fact remains that that sort of thing isn't done and that Perrin's a rank outsider. There's one thing, Archie. We must let them know all about... about us. Today, for choice. Must we? Certainly we must. You don't suppose there isn't going to be talk about this business? You must let me do my share of... Of standing up for you. I must have that right. Oh, very well, my darling. Just as you say. <laughs> then that's all right. And I shall sleep better. Meanwhile, in the senior common room, the news had been brought by the two witnesses of the scene, Bertrand and Comba. There they were, rolling, positively rolling on the floor. Oh, anything funnier than Perrin when he got up. You never saw with his hair all tousled, dust all over his back, and his cheek bleeding where the coffee pot had hit him. It was no end funny. And myself, I find it dégoûtant. A young man here, only one month, catching at the throat of his senior. <laughs> Such things in my country are not done. When they are, perhaps you'll be able to judge of them better, Ponce. Till then, I should advise silence. Of course, if you're going to encourage that sort of spirit in the staff, if that's what you want. It's absurd a parent to have made such a fuss. As if a man can't borrow another man's umbrella without being struck in the face, it's childish. Just the sort of thing Perrin would do. That's all very fine, but let Perrin treat you in the way the traders treated him, and you see what you'd say. What do you mean by that? We all know you hadn't the sweetest of tempers, Birkeland. Isn't that so, White? <laughs> no, you're, you're perfectly right, Birkeland. A man shouldn't lose his temper because another man's borrowed his umbrella. All I can say is that you people don't know what you're in for. If you go on encouraging people like Trail to go about stealing things... Look here, Comba, you've no right to use the word steal. I call it stealing. When a man takes something that isn't his and keeps it... He didn't keep it. You're grossly prejudiced, as you always are. What about yourself, Comba? People in glass houses... We may as well have this out. There are people who aren't fit to be in gentlemanly society. I'm not mentioning names, but if people occasionally looked at themselves, it might be better for all concerned, and there might be a chance of decent behaviour in a decent society. I say, you fellows, what do you think? Trail has just told me he's engaged to Miss Desert. Well, I damned. That's new, certainly. I can't say I'm pleased, exactly. I shan't rush to congratulate them. I've always had a weakness for Isabel Desert. My wife will be on her side, of course. Of course, we all know that Perrin cares for Miss Desert. I wonder how he'll take it. Does Perry know, Clinton? Not yet. I'm just going to tell him. I don't understand why Comber should be so angry, though, do you? Don't you? The answer's simple enough. What is the answer? Vanity of vanities, Clinton. Perhaps you'd explain. If I must. Comber got it into his head that Miss Desart respected him, and now she's got herself engaged to a man whom Comber dislikes acutely. It'll mean more trouble for Comber at home, too, with his wife being so thick with Mr. Zart. Mm. Then White insulted him openly here in the common room. I called him names. He's probably persuaded himself that a, a nice girl to whom he's paid a lot of attention on and off has got engaged without telling him a word about it. Of course he saw. I've never seen him so mad. After all, it was Trail's fault, though. He did take Perrin's umbrella. You see, there are two Mr. Perrins. What on earth do you mean by that? Just that. When he was a boy, he probably had ideas about being a hero. Trumpets and bands in his face in the papers. Mm -hmm. Now he's missed it all and knows it. Knows the missing is all his own fault. It's no joke for Perrin, I can tell you. 
He lives in a spiteful and malignant world which is always trying to do him down. Mm. It's a fantastic theory, but it does to some extent explain Perrin. It's good of you, Tintum. Thanks. But two Perrins? No, too much of a bad thing. All the same, I can't help being sorry for the poor brute. He wouldn't thank you for that. No, I don't suppose he would. I wonder what he'll do when you tell him about Trail and Miss Desart. Meanwhile, there is Mr. Perrin sitting drearily and alone in front of his somber fire. He had long ago realized that there were two Mr. Perrins. One a hero with a ready belief in his own powers. Then the other, pompous, sarcastic, bitter. He saw them both. Mr. Perrin this morning had been fierce and strong and warlike. But the other Mr. Perrin was afraid. If this sort of thing continued, the first Mr. Perrin might disappear altogether. This term has been worse than ever. And I've begun it so determined to make a good thing of it. If only I could have my chance. Get away from Moffat's. Prove the kind of man I could be. Of course, there's Miss Dessart. My beacon light. My salvation. I could show her the kind of man I could be. You come in? Something you want, Clinton? No, thanks. I'm taking prep. Won't you sit down? No time, I'm afraid. I just wondered if you'd heard the news. Trail's engaged to Miss Desart. He's just told me. Perrin did not move. His hands began to shake. Then suddenly his head fell between his shoulders and his body heaved with sobs. Then he began to pace his room up and down like an animal in a cage. I think that's wonderful news, Isabel, dear. <laughs> He's such a nice young man. I'm glad you think so. Uh, and talking of niceness, I always think this bedroom of yours and Freddy's is essentially nice. Oh, I'm glad you think so. Of course, I've done my best with it, but... Those silver things and the china all seem to welcome me in spite of the wallpaper. Just come and sit on the bed beside me. I'm so happy for you. Though Freddy doesn't like Archie over the football or something equally silly, Isabel, dear, I love you and I want you to be happy. Of course, it is wonderful. I never knew how wonderful until it actually happened. Oh, love is more than the finest writer has ever said and... Uh... Not, I suspect, quite so much as the humblest lover has ever thought, which is pessimistic of me, but it only means I'm ready for all the possible surprises. And you'll find it just whatever you make it. I don't think the other party has much to do with it. You never lose what you give, dear, and no one could be a brute to you. And now, tell me, what is this I hear about your young man and Mr. Perrin? Because I only heard a few words from Freddy. Oh, it seems the silliest sort of affair, but it's a pity, because it may make trouble. That's why we announced our engagement today, because I'm... I'm afraid it'll be a case of taking sides. It looks as though there were going to be lots of opportunity for taking sides this time. And it really is too silly. Apparently, Archie took Mr. Perrin's umbrella to preparation in the upper school without asking him. Uh, yes. And when Mr. Perrin asked for his umbrella and Archie admitted that he'd taken it, there was a regular fight. And the worst of it is there were lots of people there. And now it's all over the school and no one will leave it alone as they should. Silly. Well, my dear, you know that I'm behind you, but I'm afraid Freddy won't be because he doesn't like Archie. There's no getting over that. And then there are all the others. I, I don't like to think about it at all. Next afternoon was, as it happened, Mrs. Combers at home day, and the ladies of the establishment all came to tea. The two Mrs. Madder, Mrs. Dormer, and Mrs. Moy Thompson. The Mrs. Madder were the matrons, and the elder Miss Madder, stout, good-natured and comfortable, had not of herself any malice at all. 
but her thin bony sister, with eyes looking straight down her nose, influenced her sister to a wonderful extent. So, Miss Dezat's engaged to Mr. Trail. Had you heard, Mrs. Comber? Yes, isn't it delightful? Uh, do have one of those little pink cakes, Mrs. Moy Thompson. They're quite fresh, I'm sure. <laughs> and I'm sure we're all delighted, Miss Madder. Aren't they both a little young for marriage? And I heard something from my husband about Mr. Perrin and Mr. Trail tumbling about together on the floor. Mm. Something about an umbrella, I believe. I heard something about it this morning. Well, you were down there this morning, Miss Mallard. Tell us about well, it. I, I understand that Mr. Trail borrowed Mr. Perrin's umbrella without asking. And there was a dispute. I never quite liked Mr. Trail, so I can't say that I altogether congratulate Miss Desart. It sounds as if Mr. Trail has an uncertain temper. I should say very uncertain. If you ask me, the whole thing boils down to a question of order. When a younger master flings an older one to the ground before a large audience, the whole system of education is in danger. There's no knowing where things will begin or end. We shall have the first and second form boys showing what they can do with knives and pistols. Well, after all, one has one's things. I'm sure you will agree with me, Mrs. Comber. And if one didn't keep a tight hold on them these days, one wouldn't know where one would be. What will happen, I should like to know, to our schools, our boys, and in the end to our country, if we can't keep order? It is rather difficult when a young man has been behaving in this way to congratulate the young lady to whom he has just engaged himself. I've known of too many married lives ruined by this question of discipline. If the husband is the kind of man who believes in blows and riot, then the wife will be in for a very poor time of it. You know, really, Mrs. Dormer, you are a little inaccurate. I'm sure I should never want to knock anyone down over an umbrella. I can't help feeling, Mrs. Comber, that you've rather misunderstood our position in this matter. If I have, I'm sure I'm very sorry. I don't think we can any of us have two feelings about the whole question of discipline. I'm sure you agree with us there, Mrs. Comber. Of course. After they had all gone, Freddy still had to be faced. What on earth the girls thinking of? They're both too young. I'll tell her as much. Don't say anything to her, Freddy, please. She's so happy about it. And the dear girl's been so good to us, and she deserves her happiness. If Mr. Trail was a little hasty, he's very young, and Mr. Perrin isn't easy to get on with. You've said as much yourself often. Whatever I may have said, I've never advocated stealing or hitting your betters in the face. If you think I have, you're mightily mistaken. You've let the fire go out. This is a nice, cheerful room for a man to come home to when he's tired and cold from work. I've got a nice, pleasant little wife. I'm lucky. By George, I am. Look here. We've got to come to an understanding about this business. What business? Why, young trail. I'm not going to have my wife encouraging him in this affair. I object to him. He's conceited and impertinent prig, and he wants putting in his place. I won't have him in the house, and it's just as well he should know about it, so don't go asking him here. But I've told Isabel that I'm glad about her engagement, and I am glad. I like Mr. Trail, and you know, Freddie, dear, you're not quite fair to him because of his football or something. You don't mind Mr. Trail, really. And you know you don't like Mr. Perry. Look here, my lady. You just leave things alone. That aren't your business. You mustn't do that, Freddy. You can't insult Isabel here when she's been such a good friend to us both. I love her. And the man she's going to marry is my friend. So you defy me, do you? I tell you, he shall not come here. And I say that he shall. We'll see who's master here, my lady. <gasps> You've, you've cut your hand on my brooch. My dear. My dear. Don't look at me like that. I didn't mean... I'm terribly ashamed of myself. You never struck me before, Frederick. At least you've never done that. I am so sorry, my dear. C 
curse this place. It's done for me. I'm no good. No good at all. During the month that followed, there was no one who had not his or her special grievance against someone else. The change in Freddy Comber was particularly marked. Isabel had never liked him so much before, but she found herself in the difficult position of having to tackle her Archie. It's no good talking about it, Isabel, darling. Old Perrin is a bounder, that's all there is to it. I'd do anything in the world for you, and that goes without saying, but there are things a man can't do. I don't expect you to go and apologise to Mr. Perrin. So I should hope. I never meant to knock the fellow down. I never knew I'd taken his infernal umbrella. That's a lot of fuss about nothing. That's so like a man. After all, the thing's all over. All I'm concerned with is standing up for you, Isabel. I, I won't have anything more to do with Perry. Now, that's flat. He always wanted to be lonely, thinks himself too good for other people's society, and that's the fact. I've never really quarrelled with anyone before, and now Comber and that little French worm Ponce go stiff and sulky whenever I run across them, and Moy Thompson bullies me whenever he gets a chance. Not that I'm going to stay on here in the circumstances. Well, I'm only anxious to get you out of it all as soon as may be. Even the boys in my class, they don't please me any more. I snap at them over nothing in particular. Well, you're always gentle with me, darling. <laughs> and I'm not allowing things to worry me. Yeah, but they do. I've watched you. Proud with Miss Madder, haughty with Moy Thompson, gentle with poor Mrs. Comber. Uh, but you're always amusing and cheerful with me. I do my best. But sometimes I lie in bed at night trying to puzzle things out. All I want is to get you out of it all before things damage you. Love and death are simple things, it seems to me, compared with the problem of people getting along together. Only three weeks before the end of term, Isabel suddenly became conscious of Mr. Perrin in a different way. In another week, examinations would begin, and something in the atmosphere permeated the place. It was the first week of December, and snow had begun to fall. Isabel and Mrs. Comber sat in the latter's little drawing room over a roaring fire. There was no other light in the room. I can see you're not happy, my dear. What's the trouble? Oh, I don't know, really. Perhaps that look in Archie's eyes when I said goodnight to him last night after chapel. Oh, what are we all doing fighting like this? I can't stand it any longer. What's the matter with everybody? I want to be pleasant to somebody for a change. But the last three weeks has been no peace at all. I know how you feel, dear. I'm very tired, too, and it's a good thing there are only three weeks of term left. I'm sure that somebody would be cutting somebody's throat if term lasted any longer. And I wouldn't much mind if somebody would cut mine. No, you mustn't. <laughs> My dear, you're so good to me. I don't know what I should have done this term without you and... Now my eyes are a perfect size and Freddy will be coming in. I'm sorry for making you fool of myself, but things get worse and worse. I can't stand it any longer. Dear Mrs. Comber, do tell me about these last weeks if it'll help you. I've seen that something's happened between you and Mr. Comber. I can see that he's dreadfully sorry about something, but he wants to make it up. This silence is worse than anything. If you'd only have it out, both of you, I'm sure it would come all right. No, dear. Uh, Freddy and I will get all right again, I expect, and be even better together than we were before. But all this business has shown me that I'm a hopeless failure. I'm the loneliest person in the world. I'm not grumbling about it, because I suppose I am careless and silly and untidy, but I don't think anyone's wanted friends quite as badly as I have, and some people have such a lot. I used to think it was all just chance. Now I know it's really me, myself. And now you're going to be married and there's an end of you. The only person I had. Oh, Archie and I, Mrs. Comber, will care for you to the end of your days. And you'll come and stay with us, won't you? My oh, dear. You know how Freddy feels about you. I've seen him looking at you during these last weeks as though he could die for you. And then he's been afraid to say anything. 
It's only this horrid place that's got in the way so dreadfully. Do you really think so? If only I could think that, because lately I fancy Freddy has been different, and he's such a dear when he likes to be if he isn't worried about his form. But things are always worse when exams come round. I always pray that the last two weeks of term may be got through as quickly as possible. Something quite dreadful did happen to us the other day. And I know he was ashamed of himself, poor dear. Perhaps everything will be all right. There, there's something else, Isabel, dear. I don't want to scare you, but Mrs. Dorman noticed it as well. I know it's really silly of me, of course, but I don't like it. What is it you don't like? Well, it's Mr. Perrin, I suppose. He's been looking so queer ever since he had that quarrel with your Archie. I dare say you haven't noticed anything in it. Maybe all my imagination in a place like this one can imagine anything. How does he look queer? Well, it's his eyes and things the boys say about him. You know, I've been wondering whether perhaps he didn't care about you rather a lot. Whether that isn't another reason for his disliking Archie. Care about me? Oh, well, of course not. He's only spoken to me once or twice. Well, I watched him looking at you in chapel in the strangest way. And the boys say he's very strange in class sometimes. Mr. Clinton was telling me that sometimes when Archie's there, he gets very white and shakes all over and leaves the room. I, I only want you to warn Archie to be careful. He might do anything. But what could he do? I don't know, dear. But when examinations start, they do seem to get into the men's heads so. On the next morning, Mr. Perrin came and spoke to Isabel. When he came up to her, his gown hanging loosely about him, with his heavy black mortarboard, his thin haggard cheeks and staring eyes, his straggly, unkempt moustache, Isabel had a moment of unaccountable fear. Miss... Miss Desert? How do you do, Mr. Perrin? I haven't seen you for quite a time. I've just been wanting to say... Yes? To... to congratulate you. Oh, thank you. Thank you so very much. I hope you'll be very happy. I'm sure you will. I'm afraid I'm a little late with my good wishes. Yes. Good morning. As she watched his black gown waving behind him as he went down the path, she knew that her vague fear had taken definite form. Many things had happened to Mr. Perrin. On the night after Clinton had told him of Miss Dessart's engagement to Trail, he did not go to bed. He sat over his black grate until the morning. As the room grew colder and the grey dawn came in at the window, he knew that Isabel Desart had never cared for him. How could she care for a man like him? What had God meant by making him a man like that? He would like to take his revenge on God. He would show God that he was not the sort of man to be played with like that. He would mock at him and show that he didn't care. That he was not afraid. But he was afraid. Terribly afraid. He had always been afraid. Ever since when he was a very small boy, a clergyman had painted pictures of hell with lurid accuracy. On this night, for the first time in his life, the second Mr. Perrin seemed to have a concrete appearance. He was standing and watching in a corner of the room. There's something you want me to do, isn't there? Something to do with the young Trail? Don't think I'm angry with Trail. It's not that. Just tell me, what is it you want me to do to young Trail? I suppose I could kill myself and end it all. But I'm afraid to kill myself. Even to think of killing myself. I'm no good. I'm done for. And I want Isabel Desart. 
I tell you, I want her. Young Trail, I hate him. If I can harm him, I will. I must finish writing to my mother. Uh, let me see. Uh, I didn't write last week. I had too much to do with the exams coming along and everything. I'm really very well, except that I have those headaches. Nothing to worry about, and I'm taking those liver pills you recommended. I hope you are all right, and that Dr. Saunders comes to see you every week. Keeping warm's the thing in this weather, old lady. And that shawl Miss Bennett gave you is the very thing. So wear it and don't sit in any drafts. Oh, God, please help me. Don't let me go back again to the state I've just been in. But there's no time. They won't leave me alone. Please, God, give me my chance. Give me someone to love. I'm so terribly alone. Nobody wants me. I'm so afraid of what I may do. He looked up. The second Mr. Perrin was still there, a grey figure watching from the corner of the room. Mr. Perrin knew then that God had not answered his prayer. So he cursed God. He was sure now that God hated him. Equally sure the trail must go if he, Perrin, was to recover peace of mind. I can't think, Comber, why Moy Thompson's given you that extra Latin to do. No, oh, for God's sake, stop it, Dormer. Just keep quiet about oh, it. Leave it alone, Comber. Oh, we're all as tired out as we can be. We've had enough fighting this term to last us a century. Dormer's right. We're a wretched crew. How long are we going to stand it? Most of us have lost any pluck we had. This term has been worse than any other since I've been here. Sometimes I've thought we've no right to be here at all. How do you mean, Birkeland? We weren't always like this, fighting and cursing like beasts, without decency or friendliness. We didn't always have a man over us who used us like slaves because we were afraid to quit. Do the governors know the kind of man we've got over us? I tell you, it's not too late to go to them and tell them that unless they improve things, remove Moy Thompson and give us more freedom, we will leave in a body. We're not dead yet. Let's act together and break free. You're right, Birkeland. We won't stand it. It's our last chance. Let us go and face Moy Thompson now. The headmaster would like to see Mr. White as soon as possible. For a moment, White seemed to hesitate. Then, with a helpless gesture of his hand, he moved slowly with hanging head out through the door. There was a silence. And then from his chair in the dark corner, Perrin laughed. There were always three of them together now. Perrin himself, the second Mr. Perrin, and Trail. Perrin wondered that other people didn't notice his companions but probably they were too deeply occupied with their own affairs. Ah, young garden. I haven't seen much of you lately. How do the exams go? Uh, I couldn't do the geography this morning, sir. And where do you go for your holidays, garden? I'm not sure, sir. Perrin thought that he would surprise God by killing Trail. God would not be expecting that. Still more would he surprise Muffets, which had treated him so cruelly for so long. So you settled on Cromer Garden. Very pleasant. And you, Larkin? Would be, sir. Uh, it's a long way. Oh, well, you'll be able to read your holiday task in the train. <laughs> Meanwhile, Mrs. Comber, in her bedroom, was smiling. Well, thank God this term's over. I've never hated anything like it. 
And if it had lasted another week, I should have cut off Mrs. Dormer's head for the way she's been treating you. Archie's not coming back, you know. Yes, I know. Of course, it's the wisest thing. And if only Freddy was as young, we'd have been off tomorrow. But I'm glad you and Archie are getting away. It was touching him a little. Yes, I saw it. I hope he may be able to get some kind of government job. Are you and Mr. Comber? Yes. Ah. Things are a lot better than they have been, Kurt. Things rub you up, you know, and then you find the thrills aren't there any longer, so you've got to make up your mind to just getting along. <laughs> now, shall I wear the big yellow hat or the black one this afternoon? Oh, the black one fits the occasion better. Hello, Birkeland. What's all this? I'm glad to see you. I'm just off for good. Well, for good or bad. Oh, yes, one more struggle before I die. Nothing could be worse than this. So I gave him my notice last week. Oh, uh, it's mad enough, I suppose, but I've saved a tiny bit of money and I shall have a shot at anything. After all, it can't be as bad as Moffat's. Well, I'm damned we're both in the same boat. Hardly. You've got youth and a beautiful lady to help you. Just wish me luck. Of course. And we'll see heaps of each other. No, I'm better alone. But I'll come and see you one day. You've had a hard dose of things, Trail. But after all, you met Mr. Zartia. Which makes it worthwhile 50 times over. Tomorrow will be too late. Everyone will be gone. Trail included. It will be worse than ever because Trail will have escaped me. The thing has got to be done. Mr. Perrin sat, staring into the dark, with one of the long kitchen knives on the table beside him. Next morning early, Mr. Perrin saw Trail go out and take the road that led down to the sea. I say, is that you, Perrin? Yes. I'm wet and I'm cold. Why did you come out here? I couldn't sleep, that was all. I saw you go out. I know. I knew that you were following me. You knew? Do you know why? No. I followed you because I hate you. I mean to do for you. My mind's made up. Oughtn't you to give me your reasons? Yes, that's only fair. It's all plain enough, really. You've taken everything I had away from me. Not that I have had much. Moffat's helps all your worst things. Twenty years of Moffat's. I had ideals once. I lost them all. I always used to hope that people would like me. And I would have done anything for anyone if it had happened. But it never did. I suppose I'm beaten. It doesn't make it easier, living so close when you're naturally irritable. Yes, I know. No one cared whether I liked them or not. And then they began to laugh at me. I couldn't stand that. I was always hoping that things would be better, but each time it got worse. Yes, I know. You came. And soon you began to laugh at me like the rest. Oh, no, I'm sure. Oh, but you did. I didn't mean... You were... Uh, popular. I hated that. You took the boys away from me. No, I'm sure. Yes, I... you did. Then we quarreled over that umbrella. I was angry because the world would laugh at me all the more. Oh, I'm sorry about that. It was all so silly. It's the silly things that matter here. And then you see, I loved Miss Desart. God, I'd never suspected that. I have loved her for a long time. I've begun to think that she loved me. So I hate you more and more for taking away my last hope. I will kill you because you have made life no good to me. And then I will kill myself. I am sorry. I had no idea that you loved Miss Desart. I suppose I am stupid about other people's feelings, but let us be friends now and I will be better. No. If I don't kill you, it will mean that I am quite useless. 
So? He raised the knife. <gasps> Trail stepped backwards and fell over the edge of the cliff. Oh, God. I didn't push him. I didn't really want to kill him. I must have been mad. The poor boy. Oh, God. God. The tide was coming in. Perrin could see Trail lying stunned and sprawling with his mouth full of sand. Already the waves were nearly touching the ground where he lay. It was too late to fetch anyone to help. Yet the very thought of climbing down from a height had always been terrible to him. He got dizzy so easily. But he must do something. It rested on him. Oh, God! Oh, God! I, I must climb down to him. I must try. There's a crack I could reach down there. I've got to... Ah. Oh, I can't move. I dare not move. Oh, God. There's a ledge. A ledge further down. A tuft of grass I can, I can cling to. Oh, it's giving way. I can't hold on. Everything's swinging round. Oh. I must get up. I, I must. I must get to him. I, I must. Ah. How white his face is. His leg is so twisted it must be broken. But I must... Pull him away from the tide. Up to the cliff. That, that ledge there. I must get him up to it somehow. I must, I must get him up. I must get him up. Oh, Ed. Oh, that's better. His heart's still beating. If only someone would come. We're not safe yet. Every wave is getting higher. The sand's all covered now. I must get him higher. Where? Where? That ledge. It's just wide enough for him in this. The grass on it. The sea won't reach it. Oh, if only I can lift him up. Push him up onto it. It's so narrow I could just reach. Just. Oh. If only someone sees him. My handkerchief. I can tie it to his boot. It'll show up against the cliff. That man who bathes here sometimes. Perhaps he'll come today. Oh. I'm so tired. But he's safe. He's safe. I've done it. My chance. It came at last, my chance. And Miss Desart will never know. Mr. Perrin took his last look at the sea and the sky. <laughs> In all his life, he had never felt so happy. He took Trail's hand and very lightly kissed it. Then he let himself go, the sea leaping and tumbling about the rock covered the place where he had been.
Isabel, dearest, I must tell you, I'm so happy for Freddy. He's been offered a job at the Kensington Museum. Oh! We'll be able to get away at last. And he's had to wait so long for it, poor darling. But by the way, where's Archie? I expect he'll be here in a minute. Oh, my dear, I am delighted for you both. What splendid news. Ah, but you know, I can't help thinking of poor Mr. Perrin. Well... Now that we're going, it's fair to admit that I never liked Mr. Perrin. Not really. In fact, I disliked him heartily. You can't imagine him doing anything for anybody. I'm glad to have seen the last of him. You're not unkind as a rule about people. He's a selfish, horrid creature, that's all. Freddy, dear, what is it? Why are you looking like that? It's Archie, dear. Archie Trail. Is he... is he dead? No, thank goodness. He had a bad fall over the cliff out there. He's unconscious and broken a leg, but the doctor says there's no danger. In the afternoon, Trail came to himself, knew Isabel, and held her hand tightly. Thank God for you, my darling Isabel. Thank God for you. Something you want, Gunn? I wanted to speak to Mr. Perry, Mr. Comber. What about, if I may ask? Well, he put my back up this term over one thing and another. Mr. Perrin's a bit of an ass, but on the whole, he's been kind to me. I meant to speak to him last night at the concert, but he wasn't there. If you see him, Mr. Comber, I wish you'd tell him that I know he's really a good sort. A queer sort of beggar, of course, but I'll try to make things up to him next term. Next term, everything will be different, don't you think? In Mr. Perrin and Mr. Trail by Hugh Walpole, adapted for radio by Val Gilgood, the narration was spoken by Marius Goring. The part of Mr. Perrin was played by Hugh Burden, that of Mr. Trail by Jeremy Clyde, Isabel Desart by Sandra Clark, and Mrs. Comber by Joan Matheson. Mr. Comber, Louis Stringer. Mr. Birkland, Brian Haynes. Mr. Dormer and Monsieur Ponce, Henry Knowles. Mrs. Dormer, Eva Stewart. And Mr. Clinton, Charles Hodgson. Reverend Moy Thompson, Preston Lockwood. Mrs. Moy Thompson, Hilda Kreisman. Mr. White, Jonathan Scott. Mrs. Perrin and the elder Miss Madder, Janet Burnell. The younger Miss Madder, Carol Marsh. The school sergeant and the hearty voice, Harold Caskett. The boys, Pomfret Walpole, Howard Taylor. Garden, Ian Hoare. Rackets, Nicholas Kamara. Sexton, Andrew Jobbins. And Larkin, Marek Kleiber. The play was directed by David H. Godfrey.